Testimony of women on celestial marriage. Have I as I've studied uh, celestial marriage over the years, um, there's many books that have been written on polygamy, plural marriage, etc., etc. Um, especially over the last 50 odd years or more, and they it's very hard to find one that will put celestial marriage, plural marriage, in a good light. You get bits and pieces and snippets have to come through, but often the tone is, well, they believed that and that was okay for them. Um, there's just this idea that monogamy is better. Um, and uh, I stopped reading those books because I just felt like it was tainted. I went back and looked for books and documents in uh, before 1900, uh, before 1890, and there's there's quite a few. Um, and so this paper, I just specifically wanted to co concentrate on what the women of the day were saying. Um, and so we're going to share that with you today, and I hope you find it of uh, some benefit. Testimony of Women on Celestial Marriage. The following statements are taken from the book The Women of Warmerdom by Edward W. Tulich, which he wrote in 1877. Eliza R. Snow, page 295 to 296. God, who had kept silence for centuries, was speaking. I knew it and had covenanted in the waters of baptism to live by every word of his, and my heart was still, firmly set to do his bidding. I was sealed to the prophet Joseph Smith for time and eternity, in accordance with the celestial law of marriage, which God has revealed, the ceremony being performed by a servant of the Most High, authorised to officiate in sacred ordinances. This, one of the most important events of my life, I have never had cause to regret. The more I comprehend the pure and ennobling principle of plural marriage, the more I appreciate it is a necessity in the salvation of the human family, a necessity in redeeming woman from the curse and the world from its corruptions. When I entered into it, my knowledge of what it was designed to accomplish was very limited. Had I then understood what I now understand, I think I should have hailed its introduction with joy in consideration of the great good to be accomplished. As it was, I received it because I knew that God required it. Bathsheba W. Smith, page 319 to 320, 320 to 321, and 381 to 382. I met many times with Brother Joseph and others who had received their endowments in company with my husband in an upper room dedicated for that purpose and prayed with them repeatedly in those meetings. I heard the Prophet give instructions concerning plural marriage. He counselled the sisters not to trouble themselves in consequence of it, that all would be right and the result would be for their glory and exaltation. Being thoroughly convinced, as well as my husband, that the doctrine of plurality of wives was from God and having a fixed determination to attain to celestial glory, I felt to embrace the whole gospel and believing that it was for my husband's exaltation that he should obey the revelation on celestial marriage, that he might attain to kingdoms, thrones, principalities and powers, firmly believing that I should participate with him in all his blessings, glory and honour, accordingly within the last year, like Sarah of old. I had given to my husband five wives, good, virtuous, honourable young women. They all had their home with us. I, being proud of my husband and loving him very much, 
knowing him to be a man of God, and believing he would not love them less because he loved me more for doing this. I had joy in having a testimony that what I had done was acceptable to my Father in heaven. I was intimately acquainted with the life and ministry of our beloved prophet Joseph and our patriarch Hiram Smith. I know that, that they were pure men who laboured for the redemption of the human family. For six years I heard their public and private teachings. It was from their lips that I heard taught the principle of celestial marriage. Elizabeth Ann Whitney, pages 368 to 369. A very proper one to speak here is Mother Whitney, for it was her husband, Bishop Whitney, who preserved the revelation on polygamy. Speaking of the time when her husband kept store for Joseph in 1842 to 1843, she says, It was during this time that Joseph received the revelation concerning celestial marriage, also concerning the ordinances of the house of the Lord. He had been strictly charged by the angel who committed these precious things into his keeping that he should also that he should only reveal them to such ones as were pure and full of integrity to the earth to the truth and worthy and capable of being entrusted with divine messages that to spread them abroad would only be like casting pearls before swine and that the most profound secrecy was to be maintained until the lord saw fit to make it known publicly through his servants joseph had the most implicit confidence in my husband's uprightness and integrity of character and so he confided to him the principles set forth in that revelation and also gave him the privilege of reading and making a copy of it, believing it would be perfectly safe with him. It is the same copy that was preserved in the providence of God, for Emma, Joseph's wife, afterwards becoming indignant, burned the original, thinking she had destroyed the only written document upon the subject in existence. My husband revealed these things to me, we had always been united and had the utmost faith and confidence in each other. We pondered upon the matter continually, and our prayers were unceasing that the Lord would grant us some special manifestation concerning this new and strange doctrine. The Lord was very merciful to us, revealing unto us his power and glory. We were seemingly wrapped in a heavenly vision. A halo of light encircled us, and we were convinced in our own bosoms that God heard and approved our prayers and intercedings before him. Our hearts were comforted, and our faith made so perfect that we were willing to give our eldest daughter, then 17 years of age, to Joseph in the order of plural marriage, laying aside all our traditions and former notions in regard to marriage. We gave her with our mutual consent. She was the first woman given in plural marriage with the consent of both parents. Of course, these things had to be kept an inviolate secret, and as some were false to their vows and pledges of secrecy, persecution arose and caused grievous sorrow to those who had obeyed. In all purity and sincerity, the requirements of the celestial order of marriage. The Lord commanded his servants. They themselves did not comprehend what the ultimate course of action would be, but were waiting further developments from heaven. Meanwhile, the ordinances of the house of the Lord were given to bless and strengthen us in our future endeavours, to promulgate the principles of divine light and intelligence. But coming in contact with all preconceived notions and principles heretofore taught as the articles of religious faith, it was not strange that many could not receive it. Others doubted and only a few remained firm and immovable. Woolmouth East, page 387. I am thankful today that I have the honoured privilege of being the happy recipient of one of the greatest principles ever revealed to man, 
for his redemption and exaltation in the kingdom of God, namely, plurality of wives. And I am thankful today that I know that God is at the helm and will defend his people. Sister Howard, page 462 to 463. In 1868, I went with my husband on a mission to England, had a pleasant, interesting time, and astonished many who thought no good thing could come out of Utah. While there, I was the subject of no little curious questioning, and therefore had many opportunities of explaining the principles of the gospel. There was one principle I gloried in telling them about, the principle of plural marriage and I spared no pains in speaking of the refining, exalting influence that was carried with the doctrine, whenever entered into, into in a proper manner. Sarah A. Peterson, page 466 to 467. In the spring of 1849, I left my mother and home and joined a company who were preparing to leave for the valley. On our way to Council Bluffs, I was attacked with cholera, but there was a young gentleman in the company by the name of Canute Peterson, who, after a season of secret prayer in my behalf, came and placed his hands upon my head, and I was instantly healed. Two weeks after our arrival at the Bluffs, I was married to him. In the fall of 1857, my husband added another wife to his family. But I can truly say that he, did not, that he did not do so without my consent, nor with any other motive than to serve his God. I felt it our duty to obey the commandment revealed through the prophet Joseph. Hence, although I felt it to be quite a sacrifice, I encouraged him in, doing, in so doing. Although not so very well supplied with house room, the second wife and I lived together in harmony and peace. I felt it a pleasure to be in her company and even to nurse and take care of her children, and she felt the same way toward me and my children. A few years afterwards, my husband married another wife, but also with the consent and encouragement of his family. This did not disturb the peaceful relations of our home, but the same kind feelings were entertained by each member of the family to one another. We have now lived in polygamy 20 years, have eaten at the same table and raised our children together, and have never been separated, nor have we ever wished to be. Anne Hicken Looper page 468 to 469. I went to live with Mr. Hickenlooper's people, he being bishop of the sixth ward. After becoming acquainted with the family to whom I became much attached, his first wife invited me to come into the family as the bishop's third wife, which invitation after mature consideration I accepted. I am now the mother of five children and for 20 years have lived in the same house with the rest of the family and have eaten at the same table. My husband was in Nauvoo in the days of the prophet Joseph and moved with the saints from winter quarters to the city where he has been bishop of the sixth ward 29 years and of the fifth and the sixth wards 15 years. Elizabeth Birch page 470 to 471. In 1858, my husband having become convinced that the doctrine of celestial marriage and plurality of wives was true, instructed me in regard to it, and becoming entirely satisfied that the principle is not only true, but that it is commanded, I gave my consent to his taking another wife, by whom he had one daughter. And again, in 1860, I consented to his taking another one, by whom he had a large family of children. These children we have raised together, and I love them as if they were my own. Our husband has been dead for two years, but we still live together in peace, and each contributes to the utmost for the support of the family. The next document we're reading from is Mormon Women's Protest, 
an appeal for freedom, justice and equal rights. The ladies of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints protest against the tyranny and indecency of federal officials in Utah and against their own dis disfranchisement without cause. The document is a full account of the proceedings of the great mass meeting held in the theatre of the Salt Lake City, Utah, and was, which was on this Saturday, the 6th of March, 1886. The reason that they had this meeting was um, the government, first of all, said, we've got to stop polygamy, let's give women the vote, and they'll vote it out. They gave women the vote in Utah uh, and didn't work because the women didn't have a problem. And they didn't vote them out. So now they were trying to pass another law to, to actually take away the vote from the women, but to also uh, continue to take away all the uh, land ownings and, and persecute the saints for living polygamy. And so the, this meeting got together. There was over 2,000 attended the meeting, and then they continued to have meetings all around the state. And there were thousands of sisters who signed this petition. These are just some of the quotes taken from this document. President M. Isabella Horn, page 8 to 10. It is with peculiar feelings that I stand before you this afternoon to think that in this boasted land of liberty there is in any need for a meeting of this kind to protest against insult and injury from those who have sworn to administer the law with justice and equity. It has been said by some, what good will it do to hold a mass meeting? If it does no other good, it will be a matter of history to be handed down to our posterity that their mothers rose up in the dignity of their womanhood to protest against insults and indignities heaped upon them. It will also be written in the archives above where angels are silent notes taking and will have to be met by those persons who are waging this bitter crusade against us. It has been said by the chief executive of the nation, I wish you could be like us. And what is that? They marry one wife and degrade as many women as they choose. God forbid that we should descend to their level. We believe in the elevation of women and live on a higher plane. Our husbands marry wives and honour them and their children by giving them their names and acknowledging them in society. We are not surprised that we are persecuted for obeying the laws of God, for our Saviour has said, It must needs be that offences come, but woe be to them by whom they come. Dr. Romania B. Pratt, page 29 to 31, 37 to 38. A true marriage cannot be productive of evil, for it is the perfect union of heart and soul, sanctified by mutual consent and sealed by God's holy ordinance. The Mormon marriage covenant is as binding on the man as the woman, for any departure from the marriage law is a deadly sin and is punished with us by excommunication from the church, which we regard as spiritual death and it is dependent upon the covenants the sinner has made whether he can ever be readmitted as a member again. The Latter-day Saints regard plural marriage as an extension of all the privileges and good results arising from single marriage. Has not every woman the undeniable right to be an honourable wife and mother? of fulfilling the end of her creation, and do not the circumstances of life and statistics prove this to be impossible under the monogamic system? And were this the acknowledged law of the Lord of the land, would it not lay the axe at the root of the greatest evil that has ever cursed the land? The raising of an intelligent and God-fearing family is the very essence of the reason for the revelation of celestial marriage. For God has said he will raise up unto himself a righteous seed. Can the children of men who daily pollute themselves in the society of abandoned women be a righteous seed? Can wives love, honour and be faithful to husbands they absolutely know are faithless to them? Thank God that by virtue of woman's inherent goodness, 
Wives in the monogamy of the world are more faithful, a thousand to one, than the husbands. And a pertinent question arises in speaking of abandoned women. If it had been possible for them to become loving and beloved wives, would there be so many abandoned? The fidelity, the hallowed sacredness and dignity of each wife's family, hearthstone, can be abundantly verified among this people. The marriage covenant is eternal and is equal to each wife in all its blessings, powers and privileges as each is equally faithful and worthy. The union for all eternity is the keystone sentence of the ceremony. The bonds, then, of these plural families are true, virtuous, eternal, welded by power, given of heaven, and what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. It has been offered to this people to, mit, to permit, without further molestation, all those plural family relations which have been formed up to a certain date, if valid promises would be given that all further relations of this kind would cease. This is generous from one standpoint, but the grounded and fixed faith in the divinity of the origin of the commandment, the blessings and powers expected as results in future external existence are of such a nature that every mother who is willing to grant the privilege to her husband will be anxious for the same blessings to descend to her sons and daughters. Our faith and confidence in the chastity and pure motives of our husbands, fathers, mothers and sons are such that we challenge the production of a better system of marriage and the records of more moral or purer lives. Hand in hand with celestial marriage is the elevation of women. In church she votes equally with men and politically she has the suffrage raising her from the old common law, monogamic serfdom, to political equality with men. Rights of property are given her so that she, as a married woman, can hold property in her own individual right. Women are not thrown off in old age as been most untruthfully and shamefully asserted. There is nothing in our plural marriage system that countenances any such thing. The very nature of the covenant forbids it. It is binding through all time and lasts throughout eternity. If any man at an advanced period of her life Sorry, if any woman at an advanced period of her life wishes in a measure to retire from her husband's society with his consent, this is her own individual privilege with which no one has a right to interfere. Instances of wrongdoing may be found in families of plural households, but the, expect, but the exceptions are not the rule. The weight of good results of the majority should be the standard of judgment. It cannot be true, as asserted that plural marriage is entered into as a rule from sensual motives. It is self-evident that it is not the case with the women, and it is unreasonable to suppose that men would bring upon themselves the responsibilities, cares and expenses of a plural family when they could avoid all this, yet reveal, re revel in sin, and in the language of a distinguished man of the world, be like the rest of us. We are accused of being downtrodden and oppressed. We deny the charge, for we know there cannot be found a class of women upon the earth who occupy a more elevated position in the hearts of their husbands, or whose most delicate and refined feelings are so respected as here in Utah. True, we practice plural marriage, not, however, because we are compelled to, but because we are convinced that it is a divine revelation, and we find in this principle satisfaction, contentment, and more happiness than we can obtain in any other relationship. 
Let our works speak for us. We are a temperate, God-fearing, law-abiding people. We consider virtue and chastity the crowning ornaments of wo a woman's character. Our ladies are educated and refined, and their lives are constantly characterized by acts of nobility, fortitude, and usefulness. Mrs. Jenny Tanner, page 45. I am free to state that this work is genuine, sanctioned and authorized by God, the omnipotent Father, that the principle of celestial marriage is an integral part of the faith of the Latter-day Saints. Nor do I say this because my parents advocated and obeyed this principle, but because I have an abiding knowledge within myself of its truthfulness. In the light of these facts, then, and in the view of the, of the truth, that in this territory there is a ruthless disregard for the local rights of the people, rights inestimable to themselves and formidable to tyrants only. I, for one, as a consistent daughter of Utah, anxious to protect the rights and privileges of my sex, deem it my duty to join with you in repudiating the accusations against us and the injustice and, ex and extreme measures of the courts and federal officers of this territory. Mrs. Helen Ma Whitney, pages 49 to 51, 52 to 53. This is the same Helen Ma Kimball who is so often brought up to defame Joseph Smith for marrying a 14-year-old. Listen to her thoughts on celestial marriage. This is a momentous occasion and the subject which has brought us together would fill volumes were it written. It is our right and our duty to represent our cause and give the people of the world to understand that Mormon women are neither slaves nor toys. Though comparatively isolated, we are not so ignorant of matters pertaining to the women of the world as they appear to be concerning us, and this religion called Mormonism, a religion which we have espoused and cling to because we love its principles, which require all to live godly with Christ Jesus and keep themselves pure and unspotted from the world. I have been <coughs> a member of this church for 49 years and am one of the women who have been tried and tested and the angels will bear witness of that today. I am a stronger advocate of Mormonism and the celestial order of marriage and rejoice more exceedingly in the goodness of God to me and my house than ever before. I know that this holy order would prove a blessing to all who would receive and practice it in the way that he designed. I received this knowledge years ago and it is not in the power of man to alter my belief. And no one but myself is responsible for my actions. Whatever has appeared over my signature has been written independently of any other person. Liberty is necessary to make life endurable. And if I have ever been deprived of that boon under the laws and governments of God's kingdom, I have remained in blissful ignorance to this day. And can say, as God is my witness, it is this gospel that has made me free. The women of Israel are aspirants after all that is grand and glorious within their reach. They are laboring for the highest glory of womanhood, which can only be attained through the untiring, energetic, pure and holy efforts of those who are willing to fight the good fight and make the sacrifice of self and the ease and pleasures of the moment. It was among the grand designs of the gods that woman should be equal with man. At the beginning, it was her destiny to be first to partake of the tree of knowledge, and though it brought the fall, it was a blessing in disguise. Adam and Eve sinned that man might be. 
the privilege is now offered to his daughters to throw off the the shackles and free themselves from the curse which was placed upon them for a wise purpose the debt she has paid and it is the plan of the almighty to make of his noble daughters queens instead of serfs that woman may reign in the sphere for which she was created the celestial order of marriage was introduced for this purpose and God commanded his servants to enter into that holy order preparatory to the day which is at our doors where noble and virtuous women, now blinded by prejudice and priestcraft, will be glad to unite themselves to men equally noble and pure, such as are now willing to suffer imprisonment and endure whatever punishment their tormentors may inflict, rather than forsake the wives that God has given them and dishonor their offspring, which they know would deprive them of their crown. The soul-destroying crimes that are fostered in the mists of Christian civilization are breaking more hearts and causing them to put an end to their dreary and wretched existence than all the alleged heart burnings endured by plural wives in Utah. Infanticide is not known among us. It is murder. It is also in direct disobedience to the Almighty's first behest. Did he not command his children to be fruitful and replenish the earth? The noblest men and women anciently the most highly favoured of God were the founders on this earth of the patriarchal order of marriage. Our Saviour and all the sons of Israel sprang from it, the twelve tribes chosen of God. It was said too that a bastard should not be should not enter into the congregation of Jehovah, even to his tenth generation. Could those who look down upon plural wives and cast a stigma upon them and their offspring realize the lamentable and degraded condition of many women in the world? Veritable slaves who, do, who dare not express their feelings for fear of the lash of public opinion, they might change their minds, respecting women women, who are anything but dupes or slaves. The women who have come out to this meeting and the thousands whom they represent could not be kept in subjection to an influence that would make them slaves instead of free women. Our only tyrants have been those sent here by the government who were not the choice of the people but whose every interest has been foreign to our own. We have learnt this lesson well that we need not look for, in, for justice from them, nor for mercy from men whose hearts are adamant. Men or creatures in human form who insult and tyrannize over helpless women and children, seeking to goad us to desperation and drive our people to commit some overt act that will furnish them an excuse to place the yoke of bondage upon our necks. They know in their hearts that their accusations against this people are false and that they themselves stand guilty before God and run and man of the... Uh -oh. before, God. before God and man of the iniquities they seek to lay at our doors. The daughters of Zion must awake. We must become active workers like our beloved and honoured mothers, that our hope of glory may not pass like a night vision. We must struggle for our rights inch by inch, and it will require all the strength and courage that can be mustered to stand unmoved against the pressure that is coming upon us from the wicked within and without, who are combined to rob and oppress us and bring us under their feet. But the women of God will maintain the integrity and face prisons or even death itself rather than yield up on principle of their religion. We are told that there are 50 millions 
of people against us, but that, as it may, there are thousands whose hearts would bleed. Could they know the truth concerning us and the wicked outrages that have been and are being perpetrated upon us without just cause or provocation? Our path is thorny, and the heavy clouds bespeak a tempest upon our devoted heads. But we will proclaim our innocence, protest against wrong, and pray for our enemies as we have been commanded to do, that God may be merciful unto them and open their eyes before the terrors of his retribution burst upon them. God is our shield and our buckler, and he will give us grace to endure and light truth to weather the worst, eternal, unchanged evermore. Mrs. M. E. Teasdale, page 57 to 59. It is cruel to compel wives to testify against their husbands, whether they are the first or plural wives. Plural wives love their husbands as much as what first wives do, and their children love their father as much as the children of the first wife. The husband and the father reciprocate their affection, and I say it is cruel and inhuman to require men to cast off part of their family and brand them with shame, making the wives who loved and trusted them worse than widows and their children more than orphans. We know that God lives and that he has spoken from the heavens, restored the gospel, restored the true gospel with all its gifts and blessings. And we know that he has commanded us Mormons, so-called, to practice plural marriage. All true saints have obtained this knowledge for themselves from God and we know we are not deceived. This is the reason we practice plural marriage and not, and is supposed, and is supposed by the world, as is. as is supposed by the world, to gratify the passions. This is the reason we stand scoffs and ridicule, bonds, imprisonment, and death. We know that our religion is true, and that. If we lose our life for the gospel's sake, we will find eternal lives in the kingdom of God. Our homes were happy ones before this cruel crusade was urged against us. We were satisfied and happy with the husbands of our choice and with our children, whom we prize as precious gifts from God. We will not give up one principle of our religion, but will keep the laws of God and sustain and encourage our husbands to do the same fearless of the consequences, for we are confident that our Father will sanctify all our afflictions unto us, and in his own time will avenge us of all our wrongs and reward us for all that we have suffered. Well done, Candice. That was a mammoth reading. In closing, why have these women's voices been lost in the pages of history? as so many of them testify celestial marriage is one of the greatest principles ever revealed to man for his redemption and exaltation in the kingdom of God. And that was Wilmarth East. Now in the 21st century, many noble and virtuous women are blinded by prejudice and priestcraft, as Helen Ma Whitney said. And as Joseph Smith taught, the doctrine of plural and celestial marriage is the most holy and important doctrine ever revealed to man on the earth, and that without obedience to that principle, no man can ever attain to the fullness of exaltation and celestial glory. It is our desire to learn and understand celestial marriage as taught through Joseph Smith by our, our Saviour Jesus Christ. I bear testimony that celestial marriage is part of celestial law, along with the law of consecration, and that the celestial law will need to be reinstituted in preparation for the building up of Zion, meaning the new Jerusalem. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.